There are four main ingredients in beer. There's malted barley, uh, there's hops, yeast, and water, which to me is probably the most important ingredient. When we first started 12 years ago, we found this great building, uh, and, and we just had to put a brewery in here. It was just begging for it. The problem was the water supply. Tempe water, although potable, has a certain flavor to it, which could really taint the beer and really make it inconsistent because the water comes from different places at different times of the year. Um, we had thought about using a charcoal filter, which would get out some of the fluoride and the chlorine, um, but it wouldn't change that altering in the, in the salts. Um, so we took it one step further and decided to put in a, a reverse osmosis system, uh, which strips the water basically ion free. The good part about that is that we can go and, and build back any water in the world. So all of our pale ales can be made with Burton-upon-Trent water. Our stouts can be made with London well water. Kiltlifter, our flagship Scottish style ale, can be made with an Edinburgh water. So in terms of consistency, it's been a, a huge boon for us. How we do that, how we're able to, to replicate these other waters is it's pretty easy. You can go to um, either old brewing records or municipal water supplies around the world. You can find those on the internet. Um, and there are four or five basic salts that you can add back. And depending on what concentrations you add them back to the water, you can replicate those styles. We basically make a, a concentrate of all those salts, and as we're mashing in or beginning the process, that water is mixed with regular RO water and goes into the mash tun. So from the silo outside, which houses all of our two-row malted barley, it comes in through this auger, drops down into this hopper, and then through the, the mill. Um, what we want to do in this process is we want to crack the grain open. We don't want to turn it into a, a, a complete flour. Um, obviously that happens, as you can see how dusty it is in here. Um, we want to crack it open, expose the, the starchy endosperm, the inside of the grain, um, and we want to keep intact the husk that's on the outside of barley, something that wheat doesn't have. And when we get into mashing, I can explain that a little bit, a little bit more in, in depth. Um, so it drops through these two rollers, drops down into another auger, and then heads on out to the, to the brew house. The way that craft brewers get different colors and flavors are through specialty malts. These are three different types. This is one called Carapils. It's a, a malt that brings a little bit of candy sweetness to a beer um, with a slight golden color. This is roasted barley, which is used in making stouts and porters and really dark beers. It's roasted in a drum roaster, a lot like coffee is. So you get a lot of those same flavors, roasted, burnt coffee type flavors. And this is caramel malt. This is probably the most popular of the specialty malts. Um, the maltster will take the kernels when they're still wet and he'll kiln it so the inside will actually caramelize or cry crystallize. So you can imagine you get a lot of nice burnt, sugary, candy flavors from that. And it also lends a nice red or copper color to a beer. So from the mill room, we've milled the, the two-row barley together with our specialty malts. It comes through the auger that you see above us and drops down into that vessel that's suspended above me called a grist case. Grist is just another name for a, a recipe or a malt bill. So from there, it's ready to drop down into the vessel behind me, which is called a mash tun. Um, the process, strangely enough, is called mashing, where you combine hot water with the malted barley. Now, this, the temperature of the water is, has to be pretty specific. Between 152 and 154 is, is optimal. Why that temperature works is that there are certain enzymes in the malt that work optimally at that temperature together. Um, what they're doing is converting those really long chain carbohydrates into simpler sugars. And that process takes about probably about 15 minutes to start conversion. We like to go a little bit longer. We go 45 minutes just to make sure that everything is fully converted. We're trying to get as much out of the malt as we possibly can. To help us out, there are rakes inside of the mash tun that help turn the malt and, and mix the water around. And at that point, we've created something called wort, spelled W-O-R-T, um, and that is basically the, the sweet liquid that comes off from the malted barley or the spent grain. Um, there's a false bottom in the mash tun, a, a screen in the bottom where we can draw that liquid off. Um, now, I mentioned how we wanted to keep the hulls intact before in the milling process, and that's where this becomes important. The hulls actually act as a filter bed. So we'll draw the wort off the bottom and pump it over the top, and we'll keep doing that process over and over until the wort becomes clear, or in, in brewer's terms, bright. Once it's determined that it's nice and bright and clear, we can send that wort onto the kettle. That whole process takes about 45 minutes to an hour to get conversion and, and for it to come bright. What Neil is doing is called graining out. Um, what, we're taking the spent grain, uh, the two-row barley from the silo, and the specialty malts that we've added uh, that have been milled and, and steeped in water or mashed. Um, we've gotten out of it everything that we want to get out of it, all of the, the sugars, the simple sugars that the yeast are going to consume. Um, and now we need to get out of the mash done so we can get another batch in. So 
the mashing process is done now. Conversion's over, the enzymes have done their jobs. They've converted all the carbohydrates into simple sugars. Um, we've recirculated that work to make sure it's nice and bright. And from that, at that point, we'll run it through a pump over into our kettle. So the wort's been transferred in, into the kettle. This is where we do the actual brewing or, or boiling. And a lot of great things happen during the boil. We get to sterilize the wort. Malt is a really great vector for a lot of bacteria. Uh, we also get to evaporate off some of the water so we can concentrate it. That's also where we get to add the third ingredient, or hops. Hops, if, if you look at malt as the backbone of beer, hops would be sort of the personality of the beer. What hops do, and, and why they've come about over centuries of brewing, is that they're, they're an amazing bittering agent. Through the mashing process and through the boiling process, we've talked about sugars and carbohydrates and sweetness. Um, too much of that can be cloying, uh, even through fermentation, when those sugars get reduced. So brewers have found over the centuries that they can use just about anything, mints, woodruff, uh, chicken bones, I've seen a recipe for, um, anything to flavor the beer and balance it. They also use hops. The thing why hops kind of stuck around is that two reasons. One's they're, they're an amazing bittering agent. Um, the other thing is that they have their own bacteriostatic quality to them. They, they can actually preserve the beer. And the hops come to us in two different forms. Uh, we have the dried form or whole leaf form, and we also get pelletized form. Pelletized form is great because uh, it's the exact same stuff run through a pelletizer. Uh, it crushes it, it reduces the uh, surface area on it so it doesn't oxidize or stale as quickly. Um, it, it, you can store it a lot easier. Uh, it's a lot easier to use, to pour in, to measure out and weigh. Um, what whole leaf brings to it though is a, it's a lot easier to get to what we want from the hops and that's the alpha acid. If you break open a hop cone and you look inside, you can see those yellow glands in there that's the, the lupulin glands. That's where we get all the alpha acid or the bittering agent. Um, so it's just a, a little bit easier delivery way. We only use whole leaf hops uh, late in the process and sometimes even after the kettle. Uh, to back up a little bit, the more hops you use in the beginning of the boil, the more bitter it's going to be because those oils, those essential oils, were, will isomerize or become part of the wort um, and get more bitter. On the flip side of that, though, you lose a lot of that volatile, nice, hoppy aroma. So the later in the boil you add it, you get more aroma and flavor out of it. But there's other ways to get hops in beer as well. Um, after the Whirlpool, we'll run it through what's called a hop back, which is actually this device right here. We'll load this thing with whole leaf hops. So from the Whirlpool to the heat exchanger, all the wort will go through that and basically percolate in here with these hops and pick up just a nice, uncooked hop aroma and flavor. Another way to use hops post-boil is to do what's called dry hopping, which is really, really popular with craft breweries right now. Um, so we'll take pellets, which really tend to break up a lot easier. Uh, we'll climb up to the top of a tank um, and pour about 20 to 40 pounds of hops right directly into the fermenter after about 10 or 12 days of fermentation. Um, the alcohol will actually help uh, break up some of those oils and you get an even, even more different, even more pronounced hoppy aroma and flavor. So hops can be used all throughout the process. It's a, it's a great it's a great uh, ingredient in beer. Like I said, it, it gives beer its personality.